World War II. After Hitler's forces swiftly conquer the country, they rule the nation with an iron fist. The French people have much to fear. You're not only just dodging Germans, you're dodging a lot of French bureaucrats and policemen employed by the Germans who are as keen as the Germans to get you. With enemies waiting in the shadows, in the nation's capital, Paris, another threat emerges. A serial killer is on the loose, preying on those desperately looking to flee the Nazi regime. He shamelessly, ruthlessly took advantage of the situation for his own gain. This is the incredible story of the demon doctor of Paris and the dramatic chase to put an end to his reign of terror. May 1940, Adolf Hitler's war machine is on the move through Europe. Having conquered the Netherlands and Belgium, now the Wehrmacht is on the verge of making its biggest conquest of the war, France. When the Germans invade France and defeat the French army so quickly, they've got all of France at their feet. The Germans were everywhere. It was utter humiliation to the French. On June the 22nd, after a ferocious six-week onslaught, the French government is forced to concede defeat. As the German occupation begins, for those living in the country's capital, Paris, life changes overnight. The tricolore, the French national flag, was banned and replaced by the swastika. Paris was moved on to German time. You had Germans everywhere, German soldiers, but also auxiliary staff, particularly in the center and particularly around tourist sites. You had black and white signposts to help the Germans find their way around Paris. The French are very proud people, and to suddenly have your country taken over and be powerless in your own land, and have despots reveling in the joys of, of your city was, was absolutely you know, horrifying to the French people. Yet Hitler's reign is not without support. The country is divided into two by its Nazi conquerors, with an occupied zone in the north run by the German military, and a free zone in the south governed by the French themselves, known as Vichy France. This zone, however, is the domain of Marshal Philippe Pétain's authoritarian regime, and it instantly falls into step with the Nazis' master plan, throwing the French people into a world in which they can trust no one. There's no freedom of the press, there's no freedom of speech, everything's very heavily censored, people have to be very careful what they say. Because remember, not only are the Germans there in control, but they enlist this huge apparatus of collaborationists, as distinct from collaborators. Collaborators were just people that said, I'm going to go along to get along. The collaborationists were people who said, I'm going to make my future with the Germans. I'm going to hitch my wagon to the Nazi wagon. And there's plenty of these people. Despite these risks, defiant French patriots form the resistance. But members of this underground army are under constant threat of execution. With the Nazis and the French state ruling over the nation with an iron fist, the crime rate falls dramatically, few wishing to attract the attention of the authorities. Yet for one murderer, this hostile environment creates the perfect hunting ground. And his presence goes undetected until March 1944, when a gruesome discovery is made at 21 Rue Le Sur, a large uninhabited house in an upmarket Paris neighborhood. For five days, a foul-smelling smoke poured from the chimney of number 21 Rue Le Sur. After five days, this one couple couldn't take the stink anymore. She was vomiting, they were ill, so he called the fire brigade. Upon their arrival, the fire brigade find the house unoccupied. A note by the door explains that the owner is away for the month and gives a forwarding address in the nearby town of Auxerre. On the street, they are met by a neighbor who gives them the phone number for the owner of the property, a Dr. Marcel Petiot. They called Petiot's number. He answered and he said, have you gone in yet? And they said, no. And he said, well, wait right there. I'll be there in 15 minutes. They waited about a half an hour, and when nobody had arrived, they, they climbed up to a second floor window, uh, broke in, and traced the source of the, the smoke to the, the basement. In the basement, the firemen stumble upon a horrific scene. 
In the center of a coal-burning stove are the remains of a human arm. And on the floor surrounding it are assorted rib cages, jaw bones, and large chunks of charred, unidentifiable flesh from at least 10 victims. When the police arrive to inspect further, they discover a pit of quicklime in the garage, and within it the remains of even more victims. As officers cordon off the crime scene, a mysterious stranger appears. A man on a green bicycle rode up and identified himself as the brother of the owner of the house. And uh, the police escorted him inside, took him down to the basement, and he said, my God, uh, my head might be at stake. And they weren't at all surprised by that. But he identified himself as a member of the resistance. He said, I have, I'm sure that you've notified the German authorities of this discovery, and uh, I have hundreds of resistance files back at my house that I have to destroy before the, the Germans can get their hands on it. The first thought that the police had was that these were dead Germans and collaborators, and that uh, this mysterious person on the green bicycle was, in fact, a resistant. So they let him go. Hours later, the police discover that the mysterious stranger was Dr. Marcel Petiot himself. A warrant is immediately issued for his arrest. Yet when officers arrive at his other home, both Petiot and his wife have already packed and fled. As a manhunt begins, the investigation is handed over to Commissaire Georges Massou, one of the most decorated veterans in the Paris police force. He went to the house, he went down into the basement. Other police came to the house, including his number two, and the chief pathologist. As the police continued to look in the house on the Rue Le Sueur, they found what looked like it had been uh, fitted up as a doctor's examination room, and right next to it there was a mysterious small triangular room. Uh, it had a door that could only be opened from the outside, and it had uh, heavy iron bolts uh, fastened in one wall uh, in a way that suspiciously suggested that they were there to fasten somebody to the wall. And directly across from the bolts, there was a peephole, the sort that you have in an apartment door to look out to see who's, who's there. The discovery instantly draws Masu's attention. The peephole suggests that this was not simply a slaughterhouse, but a torture chamber. He looked through it, and he looked straight onto the wall with the iron rings. So he realized whoever had been tied to those rings had been watched through the peephole. March the 11th, 1944. The evening papers across Paris and Auxerre are the first to report the discovery of the bodies and the manhunt for both Marcel Petiot and his wife, Georgette. For the citizens of occupied France, the grisly affair of the demon doctor of Paris proves an engrossing distraction. People were intrigued. It was so gruesome. The press were able to sensationalize that. It raised a lot of questions. It raised questions about who did this? Was this really Petit or was it somebody else? Why did he do this? I think the fact that he was a doctor was an important factor in that period. The doctor has a very high status. Pillar of society, man you can trust, and the very notion of a doctor is somebody who looks after us, who looks after people, cares for people, makes them well. And so this is a complete negation of the, what we traditionally think of as a doctor. Under Commissaire Massu's orders, his team actively caught the media, hoping to gather as much information from the public as possible. And the French police need all the help they can get. The bodies discovered offer little in the way of evidence. There was a very well-known and flamboyant medical examiner, Dr. Albert Paul, who loved the press, and the press loved him because he made outrageous statements. Uh, he said that in the quick line they had found three garbage cans full of small bones, but there was no way to determine how any of the people had died. They were too badly decomposed. One thing that did concern him was that the thighs of some of the legs had stab wounds in them, and they were very similar to some bodies that had been found floating in the Seine a year or so earlier, which also had stab wounds in the thighs. And the thing that particularly concerned Dr. Paul about that was, as a coroner, he said, sometime when you're doing an autopsy, when you're picking up another instrument, you don't put your scalpel down, you use the thigh as a pincushion. Dr. Paul's observations all but confirmed that the murderer had medical training. And as Massu turns his attention to the nine bodies discovered in the River Seine between 1942 and 1943, suspecting that they may be victims of the same killer, a telegram from the Gestapo arrives that complicates matters further. 
It reveals that the Nazis arrested Dr. Petio a year earlier, suspecting him of being a prominent member of the French resistance. If this is true, could Petio be a covert assassin? Yet a witness soon emerges to paint a far more disturbing picture of Petio's resistance activities. A couple of days after the discovery of the bodies on the Rue Le Sueur, the business partner of a Jewish furrier named Joachim Gushinov uh, came to Commissaire Massou and told him about the disappearance of Gushinov. Back in 1941, when the Germans were beginning to crack down more on Jews in Paris, uh, Gushinov, who was treated by, by Petio as a physician, uh, decided that he needed to escape from the country. So Petio told him that he could help him with that. He had an escape network. He was involved in the resistance organization. Petio told Gushinov that he would have to be vaccinated, he would do the vaccination, and then he would be taken across France to the Spanish border, into Spain, which was neutral, and then to a port in Africa to sail to Argentina. So Gushinov took uh, one and a half million dollars worth of, of cash and silver and gold and diamonds and went with Petio and was never seen again. So the business partner, uh, when he had heard about the discovery at the Rue Le Sewer, went to Commissaire Massou and told him this story. And all of a sudden it began to seem that, in fact, the bodies might be something even more sinister than they had originally expected and that there might have been this escape network that, in fact, did not go to South America, but ended at the Rue de Sewer. In the coming days, Massou's investigation uncovers more and more details about Petio's escape network. And it becomes apparent that Gushinov was not the only desperate Parisian to look to the doctor for safe passage out of occupied France. The people came, they phoned, they said, so-and-so had left, a friend of mine, she was going to go to, to a doctor to help her escape. I think it could be Dr. Petiu. So they had a list of people who they knew had been in contact with Petiu and who had disappeared. As the investigation unearths countless potential victims, Masu realizes that he is dealing with a brilliant and ruthless serial killer, one who is still at large. Occupied Paris, 1944. The police have discovered a basement littered with body parts. The prime suspect, Dr. Marcel Petiot, the owner of the property. With a manhunt underway, lead investigator Georges Massou begins to probe into Petiot's past and sends his men to Auxerre, a town 100 miles south of Paris, where the doctor grew up. Interviewing the locals, a disturbing picture emerges. Well, he was a rotten child. I met somebody who had grown up in the town and he said the mothers of Auxerre always said that he was a bad child and would come to no good in, in the end. And he said, well, the mothers were quite right, certainly. I think we can certainly see signs of a troubled mind from very early on. He shows signs of being very clever, but also signs of all the origins that one might expect in someone who is going to become a full-blown psychopath in later life. He impaled birds and insects on knitting needles. He stuck pins into the eyes of the little birds. He locked them into boxes, shoe boxes, and he didn't feed them. So he could sit watching them die of hunger. As he grows up, Petio is expelled from school after school, and in his teenage years, he becomes a chronic thief. Yet he also develops a genuine interest in medicine. And as the First World War erupts, with France its central battleground, he enlists in the hope of becoming a medic. His stay on the front line is short-lived, however. Transferred to a psychiatric unit following a nervous breakdown, here doctors decide that he should be kept under constant observation. Military psychiatrists examined him, and they found him insane. I'm telling you, I have absolutely no confidence that that wasn't a full-blown act, so that he could get back from the front and be nannied and nursed. Psychopaths can be so very, very convincing, 
and know exactly what to say and do to obtain their objectives. He was discharged as 40% mentally disabled and he was put on a pension and he received that disability pension until the day he died. This diagnosis doesn't put an end to Petio's ambitions. Still determined to find a career in medicine, upon leaving the army, he takes advantage of a new government course to become a doctor. At the end of the First World War, there was a program in France to accelerate the medical education of former soldiers, uh, where you could take eight months of classes and do two years of an internship. And after the First World War, with all the people who had been killed, they really needed to replenish the supply of physicians. So this accelerated program tried to get new doctors helping patients as quickly as possible. It was never established that he really was a doctor, that he really had a medical diploma. He was intelligent. He had spent many years in mental asylums. He learned a lot about illnesses, about diagnosis. And that's what it was. He was not a doctor. In 1922, the newly titled Dr. Marcel Petio sets about establishing himself as a medical practitioner in a small town in rural France, Villeneuve-sur-Yonne. And despite his troubled youth and his hospitalization, here he seems to turn a corner and emerges a new man. He was a charming person. Uh, he was devoted to his patients. Uh, he worked long hours. He treated poor people for free. Uh, he would stay open nights and open on Sundays if people couldn't come at any other time. He listened patiently to people. Some people said that they discovered after they left that they had spent more time talking about their lives with him listening attentively than they had spent uh, talking about their complaints. His patients absolutely adored him. In villeneuve sur yonne he becomes a trusted pillar of society. The locals even overlook Petio's occasional lapses, including minor thefts from their own homes during house calls. Young, dashing and committed, he is the talk of the town. And in 1926, this eligible bachelor falls in love for the first time with a mysterious woman of far lower social standing. Her name was Louise, but the townspeople called her Louisette. One evening, he went to have dinner. Louise was the maid. She was 26. She didn't have a boyfriend. Nobody knew where she came from. Very soon, she was his lover. She went to live with him, but a doctor could not have a mistress who was a domestic. So they pretended she was his maid. All the people knew that she was not his maid. Yet Petio's rehabilitation proves to be an illusion. Having invited Louisette to move into his home permanently, the townspeople begin to notice that she is putting on weight, and rumors abound that Petio's new partner is pregnant. And then, overnight, she vanishes without a trace. The doctor complains to friends that his young lover has left him, yet a discovery in the Yon River soon after provides a more disturbing version of events. One Sunday, a bad smell rose from the river. The townspeople went to see what it was, and they found a trunk caught in bushes beside the river. And they opened it and they looked inside and they found the headless body of a young woman. People immediately said it was Louisette. Romantic love is absolutely genuine for the majority of the population. We are coded evolutionary to be capable of feeling very powerful emotions when we fall in love with someone. That ain't going to happen with the psychopath. What will happen is going through the motions, but it's no substance to it at all. It is entirely superficial. Did Petio see Louisette as an obstacle to his growing ambition? Although many townspeople speculate that he is responsible for the body in the river, it is never identified and the case runs cold. The doctor, meanwhile, remains free to pursue an even greater office within the town. And only months later, Petio runs for the position of mayor of villeneuve sur yonne His election was a little bit funny. It occurred soon after the disappearance of uh, Louisette Bellevaux. And one dramatic moment was he dragged himself painfully up to the stage and said, I must confess that I am guilty of a very serious crime. And everybody gasped. 
and after a dramatic pause, he said, I stand accused of loving the people too much. He promised the people he would reform the town, and the people loved that. That's what the people wanted to hear. Elected by a landslide, during his time in office, the doctor finds himself a young wife, Georgette, before his reign as mayor slowly unravels. Accused first of attempted fraud and then of embezzlement of town funds, within five years, Petio's political career in villeneuve sur yonne is in ruins. Petio was suspended twice as mayor, and two suspensions meant you were dismissed, so he was dismissed. So he decided he was leaving villeneuve sur yonne He was going to Paris. So he arrived in Paris in January 1933, just when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Within a decade, Petio will be in a position to use Hitler's occupation of France as a cover for his own twisted activities, a reign of terror that seeks to take advantage of the people most in fear for their lives. Paris, the late 1930s. Here, suspected murderer and convicted fraudster, Dr. Marcel Petiot, works to re-establish his reputation after being driven out of the rural town, villeneuve sur yonne And for seven years, he remains on his best behavior. But in May 1940, everything changes. Hitler's war machine rumbles into France and quickly overpowers Allied forces. The French government flees Paris and a mass exodus follows, the residents of the city fearful of the occupation to come. As Nazi stormtroopers march down the streets of Paris in June, they enter a ghost town, its inhabitants scattered across the countryside. Yet Petio himself remains defiantly in his apartment with his wife and their young son. The Parisians fled Paris. Petio stood at his window and he was appalled at their behavior. And he told his family they will not flee. And he also said they will not suffer because of the war. He will provide for them. While the doctor begins planning how to prosper under this new Nazi regime, the German authorities themselves focus on a very simple mission. The German military had a very clear view of what they wanted. They didn't want any trouble. They worked very hard to give the impression that nothing had really changed. And that's to reassure the Parisians who are there and to encourage people to return. Over time, a sense of status quo is restored and the returning Parisians grow accustomed to their new lives under German occupation. Yet this combination of Nazi rule in the north and the authoritarian Vichy government in the south becomes untenable for one group in particular, France's Jewish community. The coming of the Nazis taps into deep-rooted prejudices within certain quarters of the nation's population, especially the Vichyites and the collaborationists now in power. There was a great deal of anti-Semitism, a feeling that Jews ran the media, Jews ran the department stores that put smaller shops and artisans out of business. And so they are happy to begin kind of sidetracking Jews, kicking them out of government jobs, removing them from the police, removing them from the military. The Germans ordered all Jews in Paris to register at police stations. Pétain, for his part, issued a directive that Jews could no longer be in the higher echelons of the civil service, the army, and that all Jewish teachers, university and school teachers, had to resign by the end of the year. And then as the, the occupation progresses, the measures against the Jews increase. Fearing for their safety, many in the Jewish community consider fleeing the country, something that is outlawed by the authorities. Their only hope, the resistance, the clandestine army of French patriots operating in the shadows. These rebels have set up secret escape networks that can escort those desperate to leave occupied countries to freedom. But these routes out are both expensive and fraught with danger. The escape routes were part of the resistance activities from the very start. There was an escape route which ran through Brittany and across the Channel. Others down to points on the Pyrenees, getting people into Spain, and then if necessary down to Gibraltar, 
or to Lisbon. And to get across the demarcation line, you needed the help of someone called a passeur, who was someone who helped you pass through, get over the demarcation line. And it wasn't always easy, and they weren't always reliable. It is within this hostile environment that Dr. Marcel Petio spots an opportunity. Due to wartime conditions and German plundering of France's resources, the people of Paris are impoverished. Yet since the start of the occupation, the doctor has thrived, supplementing his income with various illicit activities, including selling narcotics to drug addicts and offering illegal abortions. His criminal schemes are so successful, he's able to purchase a second home with the profits, a large property at 21 Rue Le Sur. Still wanting more, in late 1941, he visits local barber Raoul Fourier, a man with connections in the Parisian underworld. And here, Petio concocts an elaborate story. Petio told Fourier that he's a resistance. He is the head of a resistance cell named Flytox. And Flytox had an escape network. So if they knew of anybody who wanted to flee from France and the Nazis, especially Jews, Flytox could help them. He said his undercover name was Dr. Eugène. Petio lays out the full deal. For a minimum of 25,000 francs, he can provide false papers and vaccinations and take the escapees to a safe house where they will be met by a people smuggler. This individual will then take them into Spain, and from here they will travel to Sanctuary in Argentina. He also told Fourier that their potential escapees should bring their most valuable possessions along. Watches, jewelry, cash, gold bullion. Petio offers Fourier a share of Flytox's fee if he can spread the word and identify potential escapees. Within a matter of weeks, through his underworld contacts, the barber provides Petio with his first set of exiles, a group of French criminals who have fallen foul of the Nazis. These include thief and pimp Joe Le Boxeur, his mistress Claudia Chamou, and hardened criminal and collaborator Adrian Le Basque. Between the end of 1941 and the beginning of 1942, eight of this criminal gang are met individually by Petio and taken to his house at 21 Rue Le Sur. Here, they receive their vaccinations, and afterwards, none of them are ever seen alive again. The escape network is up and running. It was possible for him to really invite his victims to package themselves perfectly as victims. You had people who were desperate to escape. You asked them to take everything they owned and convert it into gold, jewels, and, and liquid cash uh, to bring few possessions because you're gonna be traveling light. Not tell anybody where you're going. Uh, don't bring any identification papers. Remove all the marking from your clothes. They made themselves into perfect, untraceable victims for him. And in an occupied city in which the Nazis were already imprisoning and executing Jews, criminals, and partisans, those apparently departing to Argentina through Petio are never reported missing. People disappeared, not only Jews, French, and their relatives never heard from them again. And they wouldn't go to the police, because going to the police was going to the Germans. So Petio thought this was a splendid opportunity to murder these people, to steal from them. Nobody would look for them. Committing what he believes to be the perfect crime, Petio is convinced that no one can put an end to his killing spree. That is, until an unexpected run-in with the Nazi regime puts his theory to the test. Occupied Paris, 1942. A city of silent suffering and divided loyalties. As the abuses of the Nazi regime and the French puppet state escalate, those persecuted, Jews, criminals and patriots, begin to look for ways out of the country. For the murderous Dr. Marcel Petio, their desperation offers an opportunity. Assuming the identity Dr. Eugène, a member of the resistance, word spreads that he is helping those in need flee through an underground escape network. But in fact, he is luring these individuals to his property to be robbed and murdered. All the while, their family and friends believe these victims are making it to safety in South America. It was a very cleverly, cunningly put together plan. 
he took advantage at a time when the affordances of the era, that is his country being overrun, with people who were desperate to leave, and he shamelessly and ruthlessly took advantage of the situation for his own gain. And while Petio's murderous plan is set in motion, the Nazis' own war crimes intensify on a far larger scale. At the Von Sea Conference in January 1942, the final solution, a program to systematically exterminate Europe's Jewish population, is revealed. While the Germans construct death camps in the East, the Vichy government of France agrees to collaborate with this project. In June, the first roundup takes place in Paris at the Winter Velodrome, in which thousands of Jews are detained. Many are then transferred to a Paris concentration camp, Drancy, before being deported to Auschwitz. These Jews are captured not by Nazi soldiers, but by the French police. The Vichyites are enlisted in removing the Jews of France, and to this day it's a, it's a source of great controversy. The relative ease with which the Vichyites surrendered the Jews of France to the gas chambers. People didn't know exactly where they were going. Neither the people who were going, nor any relatives they had. But what they knew was that Jews were being rounded up, put in a camp and disappearing. And no letters, no communications from them. And it was as if <laughs> this was happening. And obviously a lot of people couldn't, couldn't get out. But it was an option for people with money to try and find a way to get out at least get to the unoccupied zone, where there'd be less pressure. And one family who do have the money to flee from the city are the Knellers, a German couple with a young son. Kurt and Margaret Kneller were German Jews who had left Germany in 1933 when Hitler came to power. On the first day of the roundup at the Velodrome d'Iver, the Gestapo came to the Knellers' apartment. Uh, fortunately, they weren't at home at the time. Unfortunately, they decided to escape uh, using uh, Dr. Patio's escape network. The Knellers were German Jews, Kurt, Greta, and little Rene. On that day of the roundup, they went to a friend who was not Jewish. They went to hide with her. They then told her that a very kind doctor, a saint of a man, is going to help them to escape France. They were never seen again. However, a couple of weeks later, uh, parts of bodies were found floating in the Seine, which included a man's head, uh, parts of a woman's body, and the vertically sectioned body of an eight-year-old boy. These are the first of nine bodies discovered by police over the coming months. Throughout 1942, more and more desperate Jews come to the doctor for help through his unwitting escape network accomplices, the barber, Raoul Fourier, and the actor, Edmund Pantar and they all meet a similar end. In April 1943, however, the doctor's activities are detected, not by police officers investigating the murders, but by the German authorities. Yet the Gestapo are not hunting a murderer. They take Petio's cover story at face value. An informant told the Germans that there was an escape organization out of a barber shop, and there was a mysterious doctor who, who they hadn't been able to identify who was really responsible for it. So the Gestapo went to the barbershop. They uh, arrested Fourier and Pantard. They tortured these two. They very quickly gave Dr. Eugène's real name, his address, and even his telephone number. The game is up. Petio is dragged into Frayne prison and subjected to a brutal interrogation by Gestapo commissaire Robert Jodkum. Yet rather than come clean and explain his criminal scheme, which saw him murder the very same people the Nazis are targeting, the doctor sticks to his cover story and suffers for months at the hands of his captors. They tortured him for eight months. They beat him, they filed his teeth, they compressed his head in iron bands, trying to find out more about the escape network. Genuine resistance who were in prison with him said that he was the bravest uh, person they had ever seen, that he taunted the Germans, he ridiculed them, he laughed at them. They were in awe of his courage and dedication, and they believed that he was genuinely a resistant and fearless. Despite his refusal to cooperate, in January 1944, the Gestapo releases Marcel Petiot. Planning to monitor the doctor further on the outside, this multiple murderer is free to stalk the streets of Paris once again. 
Fearful that his actual crimes will be discovered, and with bodies littering the floor of his rue le basement, Petio returns to dispose of the evidence. He has 400 kilos of quicklime delivered, fires up his furnace, and begins the grisly process. And in burning the very bodies that implicate him, he exposes himself. In March, the fateful discovery is made. He let the furnace burn. Why? Why did he do that? He, he, he seemed to have planned everything else so well. Why was he so stupid doing that? Well, my opinion is he'd been arrested by the Gestapo. Uh, he had gone through terrible torture. He was back in Paris and he wanted to get rid of the bodies. He had just one idea in his head, get rid of the bodies. As Georges Massu's manhunt gets underway, in a France still under German rule, the tables are about to turn. The Allies are coming, and once again, Dr. Marcel Petiot would use this to his own advantage. Nazi-occupied France, 1944. A nationwide manhunt is underway for Dr. Marcel Petiot, a ruthless serial killer suspected of over 20 murders. Yet the search is soon disrupted as the Second World War enters a decisive new stage. The Allies are coming, and France is transformed once again into a battleground. Within cities countrywide, the resistance join the fight. The D-Day invasion was uh, the beginning of June 1944, and it took about two months for the Allies to make their way across Normandy to Paris. As soon as the Allies landed, uh, the resistance everywhere started blowing up bridges, blowing up trains, doing everything they could to make sure that the Germans couldn't send reinforcements. And in Paris, the resistance put up barriers in the street and began attacking the Germans and creating as much chaos as they possibly could. The liberation of Paris is accomplished by the Americans, British, and Canadians advancing from the Normandy beaches. The French resistance, though, is important in securing the city from, from within. The existence of large and growing numbers of resistors, who now are emboldened to become resistors by the turning of the tide, leads to the rapid pacification of Paris and its preservation as one of the jewels of civilization. The Parisians were out on the streets they were kissing the GIs and giving them flowers and roses. It was their liberation. Paris was free. The occupation was over. With victory comes an immediate regime change, and the Vichy government of collaborationists is toppled. While celebrations break out across the city, there are some who are far less jubilant. For those who aided the Germans, there are brutal repercussions as angry Parisians set up people's courts and begin serving out tough street justice. To bring order to the city, the resistance become the French forces of the interior, the FFI, and they help police the liberated streets. But with its open recruitment policy, this voluntary army also becomes the perfect hiding place for fugitives looking to escape their past. Everybody who just wanted to help and be patriotic joined the FFI and collaborators, when joined the FFI to hide. Petio joined the FFI, and they made him a captain. Having assumed the name Henri Valéry, and undeterred by the wide-scale operation that has been hunting him for months, Dr. Marcel Petio never leaves Paris at all. Remaining one step ahead of the police and proving a master of disguise, he even played a role in the liberation of Paris. Yet Commissaire Massou, the detective in charge of the manhunt, sees an opportunity in newly liberated France. With the press free once again, he leaks a fake news story to a reporter, one which exposes Petio as a Nazi collaborator. Massou clearly knew that with somebody like Petio, and he knew enough about him by then, that this was going to make him very angry, which indeed it did. Within a few days, a letter from Marcel Petio reached the newspaper boasting of how he had been a resistant, how he had never collaborated, and so on. The police looked at the handwriting on the letter, and they knew from some of the internal information that, one, it suggested that Petio was still in Paris, 
and two, that he was probably serving in the French forces of the interior. So they sent samples of the handwriting around to officers in the French forces of the interior and asked them to compare them to the handwriting of all of the officers in the FFI stationed in Paris. Massou's trap works. Within weeks, the elusive Dr. Marcel Petiot is finally caught. Protesting his innocence and claiming any murders were legitimate resistance executions, he is immediately placed on death row. Here, he waits for more than a year before his case is brought to trial. And having fallen out of the headlines following the liberation of France, as he arrives at court, Petiot comes to the forefront once again. Intelligent, confident, and entertaining, he maintains his innocence like a master showman. It was a sensational case. I mean, people had been following this in the newspapers for two years by then. And Petio had been so defiant and announced ahead of time that he was going to have fun, that this was going to be an entertaining trial. So nobody knew what was going to happen with it. It, it really, as one person said, was the theatrical event of the year. Suddenly he was famous. Infamous, yes. But to him, he was famous. And he wasn't guilty. Oh, no. The backstory puts him on the map. People have now got to, oh, let's have a look at him. What does he look like? People are looking for an answer, and they get an answer, but it's an answer that is full of ambiguities. It isn't like Petio's on trial, and then they decide he's insane and not fit to stand trial. No, we have a man who's standing up and putting forward a very elaborate story to defend himself. Petio was accused of 27 murders. He claimed that he had killed 63 people but he said his were all justifiable homicides. For people like Gushinov, he said, I got him out of France. I he's in South America. South America is a big place. Go find him. For Joe the Boxer and uh, the, the pimps and collaborators, he said, yes, I killed him, and I'm very proud of it. I should get a medal rather than being prosecuted. Why are you persecuting me this way? No matter how engrossing his performance, his story falls apart under the prosecution's cross-examination. While his wife and unwitting accomplices are exonerated, Petio accepts no guilt whatsoever and maintains that he was acting only on orders as a genuine member of the resistance. As the trial concludes, the jury swiftly delivers a verdict of guilty. And on May 25, 1946, Petio is executed. As he stands beside the guillotine, he addresses the audience and tells them, look away, this won't be pretty. After the blade comes down, a court official looks at his severed head and later reports that Petio was smiling. You only have to see right at the last when he's facing the guillotine, and good riddance too, I might add, even that's a smiling affair. Turn away, this won't be pretty. It's psychopathic. It is totally grotesque what he did. It's truly shocking, truly dreadful, and it is marvellous that uh, finally justice came to him. He wanted more. Whatever a doctor made was not enough for him. He wanted more, more and more and more and more. Would he have become a serial killer if the war had never happened? I don't think so. The war gave him a fantastic opportunity to enrich himself, and to enrich himself, he had to kill.